experience anywhere else. It needs to go and, in a sense, incarnate or focus upon a very dense, physical, limited, seemingly separate place, such as physical reality on planet Earth, in our society, with our beliefs, our collective ideas. And then it needs to explore what it's like to completely forget about itself, to completely forget about its infinite nature, to only see through the eyes of the physical creature, and to, based on, based on deducing, based on what it sees, it deduces lack. It learns to perceive that there's an absence of something, there's a lack of this. I can only have this single one experience, and if I put this person outside of my experience, they're no longer mine, I don't no, no longer experience them, etc. So we need this very dark corner, this very dense and limited and veiled state of consciousness in order for us to experience lack. Why do I share this? Just as, as, a, as a context, for understanding that lack is very, very unique to the human experience. It does not actually exist as an actual experience on most levels of consciousness. So from this light, we can appreciate darkness for a second. We can appreciate when we do feel like that. Let's start there. We can appreciate when we experience that lack. We can appreciate when we project lack, because what we're actually exploring is a particular experience that consciousness cannot have on any other level of itself. So it needs to come here, it needs to experience this, it needs to be indoctrinated, it needs to see through these physical eyes. And based on its very dense physical perception, it starts to create this paradigm of lack can potentially occur to me. Again, it has never happened, and I'll get into that in a second. But just to start with appreciating when you have felt that way, or when you still do feel this way, or perhaps in the future when you will feel this way, when you feel completely devastated because someone else has left your experience, either through death, or cheating upon, or choosing someone else, or just no longer wanting to be with you. Appreciate that experience, and realize in that experience that you're only experiencing this on a very, 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 very thin slice of consciousness. On all other levels of your consciousness, this is not your experience. You're absolutely inundated with bliss. You're absolutely inundated with love. You're absolutely inundated with possibilities. You're absolutely inundated with the very next option about to arise in your experience that will feel even better than your previous option. But in that moment of devastation, all you perceive, all you project is lack of what you used to have. When that occurs, savor that experience. A, because it only exists on this thin slice of consciousness. It's a very unique expression of creation. And it's bound to disappear. It won't last. So enjoy it while it's there, to the fullest of your ability. And you'll see that as you learn to enjoy and appreciate the lack and the limitation that you experience in such a moment of desperation, that you'll actually start to transform those dark paradigm beliefs both of yourself and therefore of the collective, into a much brighter version of that same paradigm. Therefore, it will be a different paradigm. But it will be a much lighter, brighter version of those ideas. If you bring joy and appreciation to that experience of desolation, of isolation, of loneliness, of separation. So, lack has never existed anywhere, at any time, in any place, or to anyone. Lack has never occurred. Who agrees? Good. Probably those that have come to my meetings before. <laughs> who does not agree? Just out of experience. Not that you don't agree, I don't agree, but like, who does not know this, per se? Who does not know that lack cannot ever exist? Who is not completely convinced of this? Okay, cool. So, lack is defined as the absence of something. Correct? That's lack. Lack is the absence of something. Now, in order for something to be absent, and we're getting into metaphysics here, and I don't want to linger there for too long because I want to bring it back to relationships, but just to understand this lack thing for a moment. In time, it means that everything that can exist already does exist, and if everything that already does exist, already does exist, it will always exist. So that means that if you move your consciousness to one frame, to one person, to one experience, and then you move it on to an experience where that person or that thing is not there, it simply means you have moved on to another frame. Since there is no time in the structural nature of existence, that frame still exists. 
So there is no lack of that thing. You simply choose to experience something else for a moment. Structurally speaking, there is no lack anywhere because there's infinite parallel yet realities. Nothing new can ever be created, and therefore nothing can ever also be lost because there is no time. Anything that can exist already does exist and will always exist because there is no time. Does that make sense? Maybe you don't believe it, but it's the truth. There is no lack. Not only in that structural absolute sense is there no lack, but actually the experience of lack is never actually given to you by the circumstances that you move your consciousness into. What does that mean? It means that if you, let's say you're in a relationship for 10 years and suddenly something happens and you create this experience for yourself where that relationship is no longer present in your field of vision. I just told you that structurally speaking, that same connection, that same being, even that same exact image of five years ago is still existent inside of consciousness and can be contacted, can be reached, maybe not fully experienced anymore because it's not relevant for you, and that's not what we do on this physical plane. We move on in a linear format. Nevertheless, structurally, it still exists. So absolutely speaking, there is no lack of anything because you never lose anything, because you never create anything. You simply move through the possibilities that already timelessly exist. So how can you say that when you move on, that thing disappeared? It's absent. It's not absent still there, you moved on. So that's the absolute sense of no lack. Now the more relative or more experiential sense of no lack means that even if after that 10 year experience being inside of my field of vision, having made that possibility active for myself for 10 years, then I move on. Then that experience, that person, that relationship, physically speaking, seems to no longer be here. The new experience that I'm having is filled with trillions and trillions and trillions upon trillions, speaking purely and only about the physical reality at this point, the physical illusion, of dancing, happy, vibrant, blissful molecules. None of these molecules is sobbing about the person that's not there. Every experience is absolutely rich, dense with life, dense with love, dense with bliss dense with abundance, dense with infinite access to infinite other possibilities. No circumstance ever suggests lack to you. You only ever suggest lack to your experience. So even on a subjective experiential plane, the actual circumstance that you experience, even though you may not create other things, is not actually informing you that there is a lack of something. You are informing it that there is a lack of something. And as a result, it will respond to you because that's all energy can do. It can only respond to your state of being. Therefore, it will generate the illusion, the experience of whatever in your mind mental image equates to the experience of lack. So you'll keep creating and reinforcing that lack actually exists. But that's only because the energy that we call creation has to reflect your choice, has to reflect your belief, has to reflect your definition. meaningless by itself because you are here to give meaning to it you are here to shape it if it had meaning of its own it would mean there is two things there is consciousness and there is creation but since creation is consciousness consciousness rules creation because it's its expressive energy it's itself and it has to respond to itself if you move your arm your arm will move if you give out that signal it will move it can't just move on its own without your signal well I'm sure there's a disease that does that but Speaking about energetic, actual reality, that cannot occur. Energy does not have a will of its own. It has to reflect you. Right now, are you lacking a purple worm in your ear? <laughs> right? But did you experience lack? Were you sobbing? Were you contracted? Where is my purple worm? I miss you so much. Are you, I like to call it purple. So, are you lacking a five-legged purple space creature right now? We could say yes, because it's not experienced. It exists. I'm not making this up. Because anything you can make up actually exists. Otherwise, you couldn't even conceive of it. So it exists. There is a purple five-legged space creature somewhere out there. And there are purple worms that crawl into beings here. But none of these are lacking right now. 
they are, from your experience, absolutely speaking, they exist, they coexist with this experience. It's not relevant for you to have a purple worm in your ear at this moment. And so you don't create that slide, that image of creation. But why? what's more interesting than whether or not it is actually lacking is why you do not experience it as lack. But if that partner, after 10 years, moves out, you do experience lack. There's no difference. Do you experience a lack of a doorknob right now? Do you experience a lack of whatever? Insert whatever is not present physically and see if you're lacking it. Yes, it is lacking, it is absent from your present physicalized experience. B, no, it's not actually lacking in existence. It's very present in existence. It's just on a different wavelength. When you tune your television to a different channel, you will perceive a different image. Simultaneously, there's tons of different channels going on. All you have to do to make it appear inside of the same here and now screen is to dial it to another channel. Boop, suddenly your experience changes from one channel to the other. Absolutely speaking, the other channel that you were at previously is not lacking, it's still there. You're simply not tuned into it. But subjectively speaking, you can either like what you see or not like what you see. You can either project that you want more of what you see and that you are happy with it, or that something is lacking, that something is missing. When we project too strongly that something is lacking, and not from a balanced state of using our preference wisely, not by saying, oh, hey, wait a second, I feel that I could actually add something to my creation right now, and that would make it even more beautiful for me, and then go about and do that. That's a healthy type of noticing that something is missing that you would love to create for yourself. That's perfect, that's great. You're using contrast to learn more about what you desire, who you really are, what you want to make manifest. But when it's the type of lack that is the projection, it's not here right now, and it will never be here, it won't be here ever again, it's, it's not fulfilling me anymore, I can't create it anymore, it's impossible to get it back or to create a better version of it. When you go into the lack of possibilities, when you go into the lack of freedom, into the lack of free will, into the lack of abundance, into the lack of what you can create, that's when you start to contract, no? Good, so that is a subjective, self-generated experience. Would you agree that this experience is not indicating that you should feel bad because there's no purple worm crawling in your ear? There's a lack of that purple worm, but it's not affecting you. Is that correct? In fact, you're quite happy, perhaps, that it's not here. So you're happy with your creation. You're learning about who you are. Through contrast, you're learning that you enjoy yourself in the absence of a purple worm crawling in your ear. Right? So you're happy with your creation. That's great. Now, what is lacking presently? Anything? What is lacking? Transform whatever you believe is lacking into, hey, I want to create that. It's a completely different sensation. Oh, hey, I want to create and attract a partnership that I can fully engage with and actually have fun with. That's different than saying, well, there's a lack of partnership, and based on past experiences, I know I was rejected, so it's probably never going to happen or I'm too old, or I'm too ugly, or I'm too fat, or I'm too this, or I'm too that, I'm unworthy, all these ideas. If you go down that path, I guarantee you, you will generate more of the things you don't enjoy. Right? Now, if you empower yourself, then you can learn to be empowered in relationships as well. This requires some experience. In order for you to truly be empowered in relationship, which for many people is a very sensitive issue, and again, I speak from my own personal experience. So when, when it comes to relationship, we basically put everything we have on the table, right? Who recognizes that? Anyone? When it comes to relationship, we put our guts on the table, and it's like, here, it's yours. Eat me. Take me. Consume me. I don't care about anything else. I care about myself. You fulfill me. Do with me what you want. Just don't leave me. Just don't cheat on me. Just don't die on me. Not right now. Don't die on me right now. You want to go into spirit? No. Stay physical. Stay limited. I want you right here. So we're putting everything on the table when it comes to relationship. That's why it's such a perfect practice when it comes to our spiritual empowerment. Because it will show us everything, often even too much of it, for us to really process in that moment. It's usually over time that we start healing and processing things when it comes to being cheated upon or your partner dying. It happens in stages because it's often too much at once to clearly distinguish between.
So, why do we do that? Why do we give everything away? I'm not saying not to be committed and to fully be open to a relationship, because it's beautiful. Yes, put everything on the table. But while you're doing that, know that you're not really putting it on the table. It still belongs to you. You still belong to you. They still belong to them. But why do we do that? It's because we project that all the lack that we've ever experienced in our lives is gone at the arrival of person B. <laughs> so it's, it's a very selfish, not intentionally selfish, it's very innocently selfish, but it's a very selfish approach to relationship. It's like, for, let's, say for, let's say you meet your whatever, soul twin flame partner when you're 35 years old, just hypothetical situation. For 35 years, you've held in the sense that lack can occur to you, you've feared that lack will occur to you, you've kept yourself really contained in certain ways, self-protected in certain ways, and then this beautiful creature comes along and you just dump all your shit onto that other person and say, here you go, fix me. Here you go, love me. Here you go, do everything I refuse to do for myself, which is to see that I'm abundant, to love myself, to feel that I am worthy. It's up to you. This pristine, beautiful, clear being who has no nonsense with you yet, within a matter of minutes sometimes. I see this happen, literally. <laughs> I watch people, in and again, speaking from my past experience too, within minutes, the brain goes, oh, is this a good candidate? Does, 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 mm -mm -mm. Oh, wow, she said this. Wow, she's really in tune with what I'm in tune with. Oh, yeah, oh my God. And within minutes, you can see that there's a person like, there is hope. I can dump all my shit on this person, and she might actually be able to take it. So within minutes, we're actually screwing each other over, and that's what we call love at first sight. It's funny. <laughs> it's so innocent. But when you see the stupidity of it, the silliness, then you can transcend it. Then you can see, hey, I don't want to be stupid. I don't want to do that to another person. Most of all, I don't want to pollute our connection. I don't want to pollute true and pure relationship, not a relationship, but pure and true relationship. I don't wish to pollute that with my own inability to love myself. That does not mean that you cannot engage in that relationship, but just keep your consciousness alert. Keep your awareness on yourself and notice when you're dumping stuff onto the other person, when you're projecting, when you're making them your savior. And just see that that is a projection of your own belief that lack exists. Now, why does it not feel good when you believe that lack can occur to you? It's a very natural spiritual guidance mechanism. The emotional body shows you whenever your belief is either true or false. If the belief you're seeing that's being triggered in that circumstance is false, it will feel bad. If the belief that's being triggered in that circumstance is in alignment with the way things actually work, it feels good, expansive, joyful, blissful. So if your perception of a circumstance is based in definitions of lack, you feel contracted. This is a very natural mechanism showing you that what you're thinking is not universally true. It does not work that way. That's all it means. What people, human beings, have interpreted this emotional response to mean is, oh, I am right. Lack does exist. Because the second I think of lack, the feeling of negativity comes in, which makes it all the worse, which makes me project that that's actually how I feel when something is lacking, so let me do everything I can to protect myself from this. It's a misinterpretation of a very basic guidance system. What it initially only wanted to tell you, if you would have interpreted it correctly, it would have been, oh, thank you for letting me know, higher consciousness, that the belief I just held on to is not true and that I can let go of it. It feels bad because I'm allowed to let go of it. As soon as I let go of believing in that and seeing through that lens, suddenly I feel good. Why do you figure? It's because you're back in alignment with the truth of creation. This is as simple as it gets when it comes to emotions. A child could learn the system in a day, in half an hour, and make total sense out of it 
and learn to uh, um, apply this to their everyday lives for the rest of their lives. Bad feeling means your perception of reality is untrue. Good feeling means your perception of reality is true. If you feel bad, you have total permission and encouragement from your higher self to let go of that way of seeing, not to hold on to it and to protect yourself from it being real, because by the very fact that it feels bad, it means it's not real. But feeling bad makes it seem that much real, more real to us because we interpret it in a wrong way. So feeling bad means let it go. Transform it, change it. Feeling good means milk this, mother. <laughs> Keep on sucking on this frequency. You want more of this vibration. You want more of this alignment. You want more of this perception. This perception is in alignment with the truth of creation. This perception will serve you. That's why it feels better. And if you act on what feels good, and if you become more of the perceptions that feel good, you'll have access to perceptions that feel even more good and more good, and beyond that, even more good. And then you start getting into the ranges and the frequencies that we call bliss and purity and love and balance and all that fancy stuff that you hear spiritual teachers talk about, or at least refer to. So that's all you need to know about the emotional guidance system. Um, yes, so what happens is as soon as you learn to empower yourself, because this is an inside job, as you all know by now, this is an inside job, no one can do it for you. You can create helpful reflections, but you have to walk the path. So you have to be willing to love yourself, let go of the belief you're unworthy of love, unworthy of satisfaction, unworthy of good things, unworthy of your desires, big one, unworthy of success in whatever form that may be or whatever that may mean for you. You have to be worthy. You have to know that you are. You already are, but you have to know that for yourself. You have to be willing to love yourself before you can truly start to relate to anyone else. I know this sounds cliche, but perhaps with some finer, finer nuances, it actually makes sense for you to start to apply this more fully. So what happens when two people grow apart? Either you become devastated because you believe in lack, and you feel devastated to the extent that you believe in lack. If you believe in lack a tiny little bit, but you don't fully believe in it, it'll just feel a little like groaning, like, mm, okay, they left me. Oh, well, there's you know plenty of fish in the sea. Okay, I'll surrender. But if your belief really is like, no, this person was everything to me. In other words, I am nothing. I am reduced to ashes without the love and the presence and the validation of this other person. That is such an untrue picture in the eyes of creation that it will make you feel really, really, really shitty. Who has ever experienced that? Anyone? Yay, good. That's beautiful. That was just symbolizing how much of yourself you have placed outside yourself and how much you chose for all those years to not believe that you are loved. That's an excellent observation. It's an excellent occurrence because now you can actually do something with it. You can actually realize that you had those beliefs that clearly are not true, otherwise they would feel good, right? Now, what beliefs do you have that actually feel good? Far too few. But which ones do you have? Start expanding upon those. Start empowering yourself in the perspective of, and I just name a few examples, but you can tailor this to your own needs, to your own desires, to your own resonance. I am a creature of consciousness. I am consciousness that has a vibration. I am the chooser of my vibration. My vibration then will reflect itself in my physical circumstances, which are inherently empty and meaningless. I do not have to take my cue from my circumstances because they are empty and meaningless. I can give to my experience whatever vibration, whatever definition I wish to give to my experience, and that will be exactly, exactly the experience I get out of my circumstances. Therefore, circumstances don't have inherent experiences to offer me. I only ever give myself my own experience. So knowing that, I can choose my own state of being through. And I will choose the perspective that feels good because I believe I deserve to feel good. And I believe that in order to follow the highest wisdom I have access to, which would be the most selfless thing, I have to be selfish enough 
to honor its requests, to honor its guidance system. So if I feel bad, the selfless thing to do would be to be selfish enough to notice that my perspective is out of alignment and to choose what feels good. Does that make sense? You have to be that selfish in order to be selfless in yourself and in relationship. You need to be selfish enough to start to appreciate what feels good. So, what happens when you empower yourself in this way, as I've just spoken about it, is that you gain more and more confidence in your infinite worth, in your infinite love, in your infinite power, to the point where the very person that you've fallen in love with can leave you at a whim, even for someone else. Ooh, that one hurts the most, doesn't that? Or death, perhaps, whatever. Whatever reason hurts the most, just picture that one. And what you'll start to notice in your life very quickly is that as soon as you are in a state of higher vibrational alignment with yourself, and you know that you are worthy, and you know that there is an infinite universe out there, really, in here, that you can shift through, and there's a, never an option that is lacking for you. As soon as you know that, you start to vibrate at that frequency because you're consciousness having a frequency. That's all you are. You're not a physical being. You are consciousness having a vibratory state of being, moment experience with itself. And you can alter that. You can choose that. You can configure that however you see fit. That is why you are a god of your own creation. So the more you know that you have choice only, that it's up to you, it's up to you, it's up to you 24-7. It is up to you how you feel, how you experience, and what you paste onto your circumstances because they don't exist independent of you and they don't have inherent meaning to teach you. You have something to teach your circumstances. You have something to give to your circumstances. So overwhelm your circumstances with your chosen state of being, your chosen definitions. See only your preference. See only how you want to see things. Become more delusional so that you let go more of the physical reality that's co-created by seven billion stupid people. So empowerment. Now when someone leaves you, it becomes a different story. I'm not saying that nothing shall arise anymore, that no old beliefs will be uprooted or shown to your consciousness. But more and more, you'll start to care less and less because you'll be love more and more and you'll be abundance knowingness more and more and you'll be free will choice knowingness more and more. And you want to honor the other person's free will because you know that that is you in another form expressing itself in the most conducive way that it can. And if it is guided to move somewhere else, then you wish to honor that. That is integrity, that is purity, that is balance in relationship. That means that if they wish to explore time with someone else, if you wish to be pure with your own alignment, with your own connection, if you wish to ascend to greater heights of purity, then you, I'm not saying nothing comes up, I'm saying that ultimately what you choose will be to offer that person its own freedom, knowing that they never ever gave it up to you anyway. It never belonged to you. That person does not belong to you. Hence, there is no relationship, not really. There are no relationships. It's a fiction. What there is is a free universe of beings moving in and out of each other's resonances all the time. If you get out of the paradigm that's created by humanity, you'll be so much more free. You'll explore time with so much many more people in whatever way. It doesn't have to be sexually. It doesn't have to be in partnership form. But you'll open your world to so much more richness and connection. Of course, maintaining integrity towards whatever agreements you have set up that does not mean you stay in the agreements you've set up. It means that if there is a change of heart, you communicate that you wish for a change in agreement. Does that make sense? That means that if you have an agreement in place, you don't just move away and go pell-mell, do whatever the hell you want. Yes, ultimately that is a given. Yes, ultimately that is your privilege. But you'll feel much better on that journey, I guarantee you, if you address whatever agreements you feel energetically might be, even if it's just assumed and never spoken, might be there tight to you, not really, but tight to you by agreement. If you simply address that using communication, very clearly stating your new desire, your new change of heart, 
then anything is possible. And you can allow yourself and them to be free in their resonance exploration. So there is no relationship. Get over this idea that there is a relationship, that there is you and me against the world. I mean, it's an amazing energy. It's an amazing energy when it's there. But when it's there, ideally, it's allowed to be there out of a pure free will, not out of agreement. It's even more amazing if both beings just simply want to be in tune for that moment without making any promise per se regarding the future. It's fine if they do. But then again, let your, this is just my personal recommendation, obviously do with it what you want. But my personal recommendation that if you do make some kind of agreement for the future, let it include the idea of being able to move apart from each other when your highest resonance tells you to. Okay? So you need to include, make all the agreements you want, but include the agreement to your own highest resonance, otherwise you're not being in integrity with the universe. If you're not in integrity with other beings, meaning you don't allow them to explore their free will, and you're not listening, and or you're not listening to your own resonance, either way, you're not being in integrity with the universe, and you're not setting yourself up for expansion, for joy, for bliss, for abundance, for manifestation in the way that you desire to manifest your consciousness. Does that make sense all so far? Cool. So what I encourage you to do, just to sort of summarize it, is to become as free within yourself as you can to love yourself as much as you can to find abundance within your consciousness as much as you can and i guarantee you what seems daunting to you now will be the most liberating choice at some point and effortless i remember let's see it includes someone else let me check in whether or not it feels good to share this I can share it in a certain way, close enough. So, um, like I said, my biggest fear always was that my partner would either leave me or would die or would disappear or cheat on me or anything like that. Right? So, the one that I most projected that upon probably was my wife at the time. Well, it's not entirely true, but I projected it onto everyone before her, too. Uh, <laughs> and I had gained some level of maturity when I got together with who would later become my wife. Um, so anyway, I was still, when in the period of being with her, uh, especially before our marriage, but also after, to an extent, there was still this thing. Like, I never really explored what it would mean for me to give her away to someone else, for example, to give her that freedom, right? So at some point we had a conversation. Like this was my most, this was my most devastating fear. But simply by becoming more empowered within myself, by starting to realize more and more of how creation works and how infinitely abundant I am, what used to be my worst fear, I couldn't even think about it. I couldn't even, I didn't want to dialogue about it. It was all or nothing. Like either you want this or not, I'm not going to go there. Open relationships of any kind, I'm not going to go there. It freaks me out. So it's dirty, it's nasty, it's bad, it's all, you know, all these ideas about it. Very strong insistence on it. So I went for, from that to not really ever needing to discuss it or like talk about it until at some point a conversation came up. And that was maybe two years later or something like that, two, three years into getting together. And I remember just being at this point where, for the first time really, in those two or three years, it had become a relevant point, simply because we discussed the idea of it. And I remember uh, standing in the apartment, and I checked in with myself, hey, oh, this is interesting, this is the first time this has come up in such a while. And so two years ago, would been ever, or three years before then, it would have have been absolutely devastating to me, couldn't talk about it, and now I notice that effortlessly, without me working on the idea of it per se, without me trying out open relationships per se, simply having that conversation, 
I realized that I got to such a point of clarity and vibrational alignment with myself that I realized that I would not ever, if she wanted to make that choice, I would not ever want her to not act on that resonance. If there was someone that she found in her life that would string a certain tune within her being and excite her, that would be a reflection of her soul, of her spirit, then who am I could suddenly very clearly see, hey, wait a second, it doesn't matter that we're married. Who am I? I'm a being. I'm a being. You're a being. We're creation. We're the universe. We're not married. We're not in a relationship. You are a being. I am a being. You are the universe. I am the universe. Exploring itself. And there's infinite options available. If your resonance, if your guidance shows you that there's a genuine connection that you have with someone else, then who am I to want to deprive you of it? So very clearly I could see that. And suddenly it became the most liberating, exciting choice to say, if that is ever something you would want, you're absolutely free to explore that to whatever extent you want to explore that. And so without really working on the idea of it, after simply having worked on myself continuously, as I always do, for those two or three years, I came to a very effortless point where my greatest fear, I couldn't even access it, had become this easy dialogue where I could give my wife away to whomsoever if that was relevant for her. And it, would, it actually felt amazing. It felt so liberating. It felt so empowering to myself. So what I'm, what I'm saying is that, not that you have to do this or anything. I'm just saying that as you keep working on yourself, you will naturally, even unnoticeably so, gain more and more and more paradigm shifts, more and more freedom, more and more expansion. And all these like ideas will start, to, will start to dissolve, whether you're with a partner exploring this or without a partner. And at some point, you'll just start to reach a new plateau and you start to notice that. Suddenly you look completely, your outlook on life is completely different and you can leave other people be in their freedom much more and you can leave yourself be in your freedom much more and communication becomes much clearer. So, in other words, work on your own empowerment. This is the best tip I have for your own, for the purity and the truthfulness and the intimacy of connecting with others. If you want that true intimacy with others, then that can only happen if the other person is completely free in your eyes. And ideally, they see you as completely free. Now, if that energy is there, then there can be this, this, this bridge, this tunnel, this portal can be opened up between these two beings that is massively powerful because it's literally the universe recognizing itself in another. That's when these quote-unquote higher energy centers start to become active in that relationship. When both are resonating at that same level, are able to compute with the fact that they are infinite worth and that the other person is infinite worth and that they're all independent, interconnected but independent, complete universes in and of themselves. Then you can start to relate from a truly quote-unquote spiritual level of interaction, of intimacy and points of view. If that is a match, if that is reciprocated, both ways, you'll have the most amazing experience humanly possible. Possibly. Of course, that with your own portal is always, is always the absolute, is always the truth. But to be able to then share that full on with another, and it is possible. It is rare, but it is possible. I'm not creating this dangling carrot in front of your eyes that you should start searching for. <laughs> Oh, I hope I meet that soulmate one day. Because here's the thing, you cannot meet your soulmate or twin flame or just to sort of get into your question a little bit about that quote-unquote special soul-to-soul -soul connection that some souls have that you don't have as much with other souls, which to an extent is a relevant truth um, in my experience. Purely because of resonance, ultimately all is your own soul and you can see everything as your twin flame. Nevertheless, on a very practical, experiential, individual level, it is my experience that with some souls there is a much higher fine-tuned vibrational alignment than with other souls. And that can be experienced as soulmates or even what they would call a twin flame connection where everything is reciprocated, where it just feels like you're one being in two bodies, basically. All these experiences are possible. Anyway, in order for any, any of that to enter your realm of relationship, to enter your experience of relationship, you have to have opened that portal to infinite worth yourself. So, if you wish to attract any type of true relationship or the relationship that you have, you wish to transform it to become this true portal 
than you and, in a sense, the other being. Of course, it's up to their free will. But you, most of all, need to open up. I keep calling it a portal, so that's how you can see it, like a gateway, like a wormhole, like a black hole opening up in the center of your head, allowing in, in a sense, that universal infinite knowledge that I am infinite worth. It's the gateway to everything. If you can know that you're infinite worth, it's the gateway to everything, and especially when it comes to relationship, whether it's friends, whether it's teammates, whether it's crewmates, whether it's partnerships, whether it's your twin flame, whether it's a whole group of people, whether it's a threesome, doesn't matter. That clarity, that portal to knowing, it opens up as soon as you know that you are a creature of infinite worth, infinite possibility, infinite abundance, infinite love. So you have to know that within yourself. Somehow you have to dig real deep and find that source of infinite well-being. And if you can find that, relationships will never be the same. Again, I'm not saying that nothing will ever come up for you in terms of old sort of human perspectives and that you can enter a period of whatever, a couple of days, a couple of weeks of churning through that when something is triggered in the outside. But you'll have the clarity that you need to move through that as gracefully as possible given those things that arise so powerfully from the human mind from the unconscious, from believing in lack. And then ultimately, with more and more and more and more practice, then that period of process becomes shorter and shorter and shorter to a point where in most situations, speaking from my own experience, if something drops away, you can instantly recognize, even before it happens, that that is okay, more than okay, that that opens the gateway to something else, that there, that only means infinite abundance. It does not imply lack. That becomes more and more immediate in more and more situations. So that will, in a sense, be the proof, the evidence, the hallmark of your sense of freedom, your sense of infinite worth. If there's still a lot of attachments to the outside, to other people, then it is simply a sign that you've not explored. You've not looked up. You've not realized that you are God. You've not realized that you are infinite worth, that you are endless abundance, that you are a creature of infinite possibility. As soon as you know that, your, in a sense, chakras or your energy system will open up. I usually don't talk about that, but it's slightly more relevant when it comes to relationship, in my experience. Your system will open up, your energy centers will open up and start to balance themselves, all because you have the knowledge right here that you are infinite worth. Infinite unity, infinite worth. Everything is contained inside of you. Everything opens up, and then you can give that energy to whatever extent it wants to be received or reciprocated. But at least you can give it to yourself. At least you have that portal wide open. But that portal can start to actually create a duplicate and then also a phase, a form a cross in a sense. First it's opened up to yourself, to the heavens, but then it can also start to be projected onto other people in other beings. And then again, it depends on the reciprocation of it too. Don't expect a full-on experience if that's not completely both of yours experience. There has to be the two men. But at least, at the very least, you can give this to yourself. It's an infinite gift. It's an endless gift. And it means that you won't need anyone anymore. Not even your twin flame. Not even your soul mate. My wife, in, my sense, in a sense, was my twin flame. At some point, we got divorced because our paths took separate ways, at least for a while. Maybe not forever, but at least for a while. It was obvious that that had to move apart. So that has to be honored too, but you can't do that. You, well, you can. You have to at some point, but you can't, really, you can't really go through that experience gracefully or joyfully if you don't know that you're infinite abundance and infinite worth. So empower yourself with the knowledge, I am infinite worth. And when you do, You'll be a free agent once again, because that's what you've always already been. And then you can explore relating. You can explore relationship with beings of all kinds. That can look in whatever way resonates for you. It doesn't have to look in any particular way. And remind me, I want to get a little bit into who here, just be really honest if you can, 
Who here is interested in attracting a relationship of some kind? Even whether or not you're in a partnership right now, it doesn't matter. Just answer for yourself. Who in general is interested in attracting a relationship of, uh, let's say, it sounds a little bad, but of a higher order, of one that is in that intimacy that I'm talking about? Awesome. Well, there you go. And I'm on live stream right now. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, -oh. <laughs> uh, he's asking questions? Yeah. That's okay. I'll ask real quick and then come up. Um, so the question, in a way, I feel like I'm kind of asking it for the collective, but also it seems still relevant for me. On the theme of growing apart, or like when two people, you're in a relationship, and it seems relevant to move on. Yes. That has seemed like a fine line in my world, because it's like, shit comes up, it gets rough, easy to project, well, they're just not developed enough, so I better just move on. And then it happens again, and then I better just move on. And it happens again, and it gets rocky. In other words, some of my core fears c could get triggered, and I move on. Mm -hmm. So it's, do you have any um, thoughts on how can you help find the truth of, am I just going and digging like a well three feet down, three feet down, mm -hmm. three feet down? Cool. And when is it relevant to actually move on? Mm -hmm. Or stick with it through the shit to get to the other side? Um, honestly, okay, so this is... I can answer this, but I can answer this only from my own quote-unquote level of being. And for me, that's not relevant, meaning that um, it's not relevant to dig through stuff. Does that make sense? It's not relevant to... So it's a little subtle how to say this. It doesn't mean there's no dialogue, there's no intensity, there's no depth. But <clears throat> the idea of, okay, am I just not facing my fears? That just is not real for me anymore. So. From my point of view, it's not relevant for me. That, that whole analogy is not relevant for me, like digging three feet deep or not. It's, it's that moment, and that moment is that moment, and whatever is learned is learned, whatever is gained and contributed is, is, is done, is contributed and learned. <coughs> but it's not, it's not about me facing my stuff anymore. So f for me, that personally, that has changed. Um, yeah, so this might not be as relevant, but let's see if I can answer from a different angle. Um. Because there's no fear, right? Like if there's no fear, there's, yeah, I'll see whatever needs to be seen. So that's not a mechanism. Ultimately, that's not a mechanism for moving apart from anything. It's just because something either resonates or does not resonate. And ideally, this is the case for you all, too, where it's purely based on this no longer resonates, when it no longer resonates. But yes, fine tune? Yeah, and so <coughs> it's if I'm seeing that I'm trying to move away from mm -hmm. pain or discomfort, that's perhaps a warning bell for me, as opposed okay. to am I moving toward some deeper excitement? If okay. there's some positive excitement, or am I avoiding? And I want to say this plays into what I could say some average person hearing you is like, well, this is just a recipe for, you know, wishful thinking and irresponsible behavior by just like hanging out for a little bit and then hanging out for a little bit. But I think a lot of people misunderstand the law of attraction stuff right. by when people do it by, oh, I'm not going to go for that job interview because it feels bad or like they're avoiding discomfort mm -hmm. instead of moving toward true resonance. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense to you? Mm -hmm. Yes. No, it does. It does. Um, let me find the entrance point for a second. Well, it's kind of like I assume, I assume that you all, if something comes up, that you face that, right? It's kind of logical. If you don't, then you probably wouldn't be here to an extent. So it's almost like that ideally, that would already be a mood point. I'm not saying that it should. But I'm saying that you've already reached a level of consciousness where if negative beliefs come up, you are inclined to face that and ask yourself, why do I feel bad? I feel bad not because of something they did. I feel bad because I have a belief that's not true. That's why I feel bad. Remember the mechanism I told you about? The universal emotional system that works that way to guide you into clarity. So when someone that you start to open up to Let 
such a different paradigm. It's not complicated, you see? A relationship makes it seem complicated, but it's always an inside job. It's always you and you, really. So just keep it really simple when it comes to facing your fears and insecurities and all that. Just realize that there is no relationship, not really, just for a moment. I'm not saying there's no relating, but a relationship does not exist. It's just an agreement, it's just a thought form. There's a being over there that's a reflection of you in some way. It's reflecting you. That's all there is to it. So what is reflected is shown to you by means of feeling. If you feel bad, if you feel afraid, if you feel scared, there's something there for you to look at, regardless of whether that's triggered by another person, or by a plane crash on television, or by a terrorist attack, or by the money dwindling in your bank account. It's all the same thing. Like, just keep it really simple. There's no difference there, just because it involves another person. It is all about you. When you, as soon as you feel bad, yes, don't immediately walk away. As soon as you feel bad, notice that you're feeling bad because you have a belief that's out of alignment. Then shift your belief. Then shift your thought form. Shift your, shift your reference. What are you referencing? So a bad feeling comes up in relationship to someone else. That says everything about you. That says everything about what you believe about that circumstance. Investigate it. Be as lovingly present to yourself as you can. Be excited about having uncovered a negative feeling. So you can actually feel really positive and good about having discovered a negative feeling. Does that make sense? Many people go, oh, a negative feeling, oh, that means lack. No, a negative feeling means an abundance of clarity and alignment reaching a new plateau, a new level. So be really excited about bad feelings coming up because they show you the things that are not you that you hold on to, that you believe in, so that you can let go of them, transform them, by actually changing your energy, by actually remembering that you are a creature of infinite worth and infinite abundance, and that all beings are free to be who they are, and you are free to be who you are. This is, it's, this is it. That's just a simple process of facing those fears, facing those insecurities. In a sense, that should become a moot point when it comes to relationship. That shouldn't even be conflicting with whether or not something resonates. It's, ideally, that's no longer it's no longer confusing. Oh, wait a second, do I just want to move away from this or am I not facing something? At some point that becomes crystal clear. Especially the more and more you have done this exercise of, hey, something comes up, it doesn't feel good, which means that my belief about this circumstance is not true. Let me look at it, let me lovingly and excitedly transform it into knowing I am infinite worth, everyone is infinite worth, and there's nothing that can ever be lacking for me. I can create whatever I want to create, choose whatever I want to choose. They can choose whatever they want to choose, and I will love them forever, they will love me forever, and we can never disconnect on a soul level because there is no time on a soul level. So you just become really honest with yourself, period, all the time, no matter what happens, whether you're in relationship or not. So even, so what I'm getting at basically is, the summary of that is, that your question for me has nothing to do with relationships. Does that make sense? So to simplify it for yourself, whether you're avoiding stuff or not, don't apply that to relationship because it becomes really, really complicated. Apply it to yourself in general. Am I avoiding looking at my beliefs and my feelings? If you're not, then you're absolutely clear that that's not what you're doing. You're no longer afraid of uncovering negative feelings because you know that it's, that is a positive event leading only into greater alignment. That should be an attitude in life, period, whether you're all by yourself for the next 30 years or whether you're in all kinds of relationships simultaneously has nothing to do with relationship. This should be your attitude, period. I say should, there's no shoulds. This is simply my recommendation. 
because it will lead you into that greater empowerment. And the more you do that, even when you're not with a partner, the more clearly you'll be able to sense what is actual meeting ground and what's not actual meeting ground. And when that meeting ground, that purpose, when the purpose behind the relationship has resolved itself, then why would you want to hold on to that? It's just an empty shell. I'm not saying it's always easy to let go or to break the news or to have that communication going. But at some point you feel that the relationship, the purpose behind it has exhausted itself. And now it's just for show. Now it's just, oh, boy and girl, whatever. A little bit of chemistry every once in a while, a little bit of sex every once in a while maybe. No, yeah, let's go for coffee, oh, fun. But when the purpose is sucked out of the relationship, then it's time to move on because you're depriving yourself of something greater, grander. Does that make sense? But can you adopt that attitude? You don't have to. You really don't have to. Take this at your own timing, obviously. But please, I, under I urge you to realize that it does not make sense to stay in anything, whether that's a job, a relationship, a housing situation. If something is exhausted, the purpose behind it is extracted, the excitement that was in it has been fully digested, assimilated, everything is learned from it then it becomes an empty shell that starts to fade and fade and fade. That's not a bad thing. The souls are still infinitely connected and on their own level, they're joyful and playful forever. It's simply that the resonant shells on their own journeys no longer can find and infuse that soul excitement into that circumstance together. So then it makes sense to move on. Does that make sense? D would you agree? Yes. Yes. That's not a bad thing. As soon as you feel that, oh, that sounds so bad, I can't imagine my partner leaving me or this thing that I endure disappearing. Know that you are believing something that's untrue. As soon as there's a contraction, this has nothing to do with relationships, you see? This is period, human nature. As soon as you feel contracted, it's because you believe something that's not true. <sighs> Find your way into bliss by not acknowledging that you have negative beliefs that don't serve you anymore, seeing that they don't serve you anymore, remembering that you are a creature of infinite possibility and infinite worth and infinite love. And then you move from that space, feeling completely fulfilled in relationship with yourself. And I guarantee you that the people you meet will become continual reflections of that new state of being. You cannot, in that sense, meet your desired partner if you are not of the frequency that they represent to you. Does that make sense? So when we imagine our perfect partner, it's of a certain vibratory essence. It has a certain shine to it, a certain glow to it, a certain essence to it. It transmits a certain feeling, a certain vibration. It represents a certain image, a certain state of being, a certain level of consciousness. That is what you desire, but you imagine it, you project it onto an image of a person. You can never meet that person it's not possible. It's only possible as a glimpse, but it will be a painful glimpse. I give you a heads up. <clears throat> it will give you a glimpse so that you can know what to work with, so that you can see in yourself what is lacking, what, what lack beliefs you have, and what you're seeking for, and what you want to embody within yourself. But ideally, you work with that even before you meet them, before you have to meet them. And what happens is that as you start to embody the very essence vibration that they represent in your mind, and you start to make that your own, then well, when you no longer need that person, they start showing up. Sometimes in multiple forms or in different ways than you might expect, and sometimes in a very traditional pattern, or like, oh, hey, there is that person that I've been imagining. Now be careful, because it takes two minutes to dump your shit back onto that person <laughs> that you finally attracted to yourself after all your spiritual work. Even then, in that moment, you will be first tested. You will get a glimpse. To be honest, I don't think I've ever had a significant jump in my vibratory state in terms of relationship, like meeting someone that represents that next level stage for me, without first being glimpsed that experience. If it's on a similar playing field, it happens effortlessly, naturally. But I get a glimpse you, when it's next stage thing. This is not a recent thing for me anymore, but it used to work like that. 
I would be given a glimpse. Like, can you handle this sense of self-satisfaction? Do you not need what you have when it's right in front of your eyes and you can touch your butt? <laughs> Will you still not need it when it's right there in the palm of your hand? Will you squeeze it to death or will you leave your hand open and just enjoy what you see? You'll be given that glimpse, and if you squeeze it to death, it'll be taken away from you for another while. Because you're not ready. You're not ready. And in a sense, higher consciousness will not allow you to pollute your true relational experiences, your true soul connections. And so it will test you in that way, just to protect your relationship, just to not to pollute it too much so that it's unsolvable later on because there's too much stuff in between. So be ready for the glimpse. You can give the glimpse to yourself using imagination. If she or he would be right here, if that projection of your dreams, and it could be a car, it could be a person, but it could be anything. Like this applies to any dream thing you have. Will you squeeze it to death? When you get those $10 million, will you squeeze it to death? When you get that house you want, will you squeeze it to death? When you get that spiritual realization that you want, will you cling to it? Whatever it may be that you desire, if that person would be right here in the palm of your hand, would you let it just be there and love it? Or would you try to own it? If the wind picks it up, can it go? Or will you anchor it to the ground until it dies? Ask yourself, the moment your answer is a genuine and ecstatic fucking <laughs> gone with the wind, <laughs> go as you want to. If that freedom is there, then you will get it. Guaranteed, it will somehow show up in your reality. Because you don't need it. You've already mastered that relationship before you ever meet her or him. Beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. What um, some of my experience, like how I'm summarizing that for myself in a way, is well, I guess as you were talking, I was realizing how much I, and I think a certain, you know, old school paradigm lives in stories, like lives in, in linear story worlds, where it's like, well, if I'm in a relationship, am I gonna be the kind of guy that can, when shit hits the fan, am I gonna do this, 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 or this? <laughs> or am I gonna do that, 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 or that? Mm -hmm. And it really, I'm realizing that's where that question was more coming from, where it's mm -hmm. really all it needs is to be in this moment and be mm -hmm. true with what's happening, right. you know, with the resonance of what's happening right now. Mm -hmm. And the answers for any of those questions, whenever those forks happen in the road, mm -hmm. will be yeah. like obvious. Uh, yes. With the presence, yeah. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Awesome, thank you. Thanks for asking the question. Yeah. Did you have a question? Would you like the microphone there, or would you like to sit here? Okay. It wasn't a mic for the first set of questions, so I didn't know we were looking at the mic. Okay, cool. Sorry. No, no worries, that's good. <laughs> you spoke earlier about connecting to something and deciding whether or not you were going to share something with us. Mm. And I would like to hear a little bit more about how that process works for mm. you. Perhaps we can extrapolate mm. from that a little bit. You mean how I, how I distinguished what right. I could share you, and what I you, could not? You clearly went <clears throat> into a place where you were thinking about whatever it was you were thinking about. Right. Um, and without the details of the specific person you were thinking about, mm -hmm. what did that process look like okay. internally? Cool, cool question. Let me see. Well, 
well, really, in this particular, I do this often with things, uh, just distinguishing what to me feels like the highest integrity and what does not. So I could share quite a bit about it. It's a very subtle art. And, um, and even though I personally, from my subjective experience, feel that I'm very, very clear on it, that still does not mean that everyone else will agree necessarily with your choices of integrity. But I get as close as I can get to what I believe and what I feel is the highest integrity, the highest selflessness that I can achieve in most of the situations that I would have to consider that. Um, Specific to this scenario, it was simply to see if just a variety of things, like making sure that I'm not, making sure that the person itself remains anonymous in a sense, just as simple as that, uh, making sure that I'm not distorting any views for my own personal self interest that I'm not making myself look better than the other person in any way, that I'm not projecting accusations or blame on anyone, that, um, that I'm not sharing things that are not relevant or that would, by the other person, be seen as a disclosure of something that was private in that sense. So that's, those are some of the things that naturally then I go down the list and I check in. Okay, I can say this and it would be a general statement of what I want to share, what is relevant. It's not relevant necessarily what occurred or what thoughts were spoken. What is relevant is that I want to share with you a certain process, which is that I effortlessly went from the most frightening thing two years later, not having thought about it in between that much, to being the most liberating thing, being able to generously give away my wife if she wanted to. <coughs> and this was a mutual dialogue. It was just a hypothetical dialogue at the time. So I just go down the list and see like what can I share about this that feels relevant, general, and like it's not intruding upon or detracting at all from her identity. Does that make sense? Okay. So th this was quite simple, but there is very complex, paradoxical, integrity requiring scenarios that are way more complex, that are harder to explain as well. But this was quite simple. It's just going down the list, making sure that I did not say anything that I would regret out of feeling like I did a dishonor to anyone involved. We live in a society that seems to expect when a question is asked, an answer will come back immediately. And um, I'd like to hear more about how you created a space for yourself to be comfortable saying, just a minute, I'm not ready to answer that yet. Oh, that was easy. Because I don't care about you guys. <laughs> okay. I don't, I don't care what you think. That's what I mean by that. Yeah. So I'm here to be who I am as purely as I can. And I would never want to sacrifice just learning something out <clears throat> that I regret for the sake of, you know, you guys having to wait for a minute. That's okay. And in fact, I think it's relevant for you guys to see me do that. And it makes sense and it adds to the whole dialogue in some way. So it's just, I'm. I'm generally speaking really, really comfortable um, not diluting what feels true for the sake of an external world. Why? Because I've trained myself to the point where I don't really experience an external world anymore. So when I'm sitting up here, yes, I can reference you guys. And every once in a while, I feel like, every once in a while, it feels like, oh, there's something out there. But it's so a temporary projection and clarity that really my more constant experience is that there's nobody else out there per se. So I'm just, I'm just being myself. So I'm not worried about someone else because you guys are all projections of myself. All I need to do is to be true. And if you wish to experience and define that through the sense of impatience, for example, like you could have done if I did this. I doubt any of you did. I don't feel that. But let's say that it was really annoying to you that I took a minute before I answered your question. Um, Honestly, I don't care. That's your choice. You see, that's again, there's that integrity, that relationship. That is your free will. If you want to define that moment of pause as impatient, as disrespectful, that's completely up to you. Like, it's not none of my business if you want to think that, if you want to believe that. Now, this applies to relationships too. Same attitude. If you want to think the things you think about me, then you can think the things you think about me, and vice versa. So we're all free to 
be ourselves. So I leave it up to you. I'm not going to try to avoid your lack of definitions by speaking faster or by doing something differently. Does that make sense? It, it makes perfect sense awesome. if you're you. If I'm me. Right. Um, I think what I was looking for, and not to say that wasn't a perfectly wonderful answer, but everybody is at a different place in their learning and their sure. accessing. And so for those of us who are coming newer to this, sure. can you talk a little bit about what the process was like mm -hmm. for you to learn to to figure out how to make how to make that happen for yourself awesome. along the reason this is weird scenario approximately not weird scenario but maybe 10 years ago I was at this yoga retreat doing yoga meditation teacher course I was at this yoga retreat and I was talking with this guy that had some insecurities regarding women and other people looking at him and that kind of stuff and I remembered I was a wise ass even at that age um, and we had this dialogue and I was teaching him something from my past experience which is that I noticed that when I was um, I remembered this other experience where I was dancing where I was whirling around or something like that in a group of people and I very distinctly noticed I was playing this game with my consciousness I noticed I can either reference other people and uh, contract or I could, it was simply mechanics, it was attention mechanics, it had nothing to do with these people. They're not actually there. I noticed that if I don't reference other people, they don't exist. I cannot judge myself. So I noticed that for most people it's like, well they actually do exist, so if I don't focus on them, then they're still judging me and I'm not controlling what I'm doing because I'm not thinking about what they're thinking. But no, for me it was, they actually don't exist to me, so I don't care. And then I reference other people, and then I care. And then I don't reference other people, and they don't exist, so I actually am giving myself attention, mechanics-wise, the space to be absolutely free, with no reference to other people. And after that, he started dancing like crazy, so that was cool. <laughs> so that's basically the mechanism to realize that in order to maintain your own purity and to in, in any situation, you need to realize that if you reference someone else's thoughts, if you reference someone else looking at you, you're forgetting that you are the observer of your reality, not other people. You are the observer of your reality. Your consciousness does not, in that sense, look at you from other eyes. You're looking at your own experience. So when you connect to that, you see that really there is no sense of other people judging you because it's irrelevant. And besides, it's none of your business what they think. Does that make sense? Or is that still too extreme, perhaps, or too radical? No, no, it, it makes sense, and it, it's helpful to think of it. You know, it's not like you can wake up one morning and say, okay, I get all this. Right. You know, none of you exist. Everything is... No, it's, it's definitely it's practice be a process. Getting, getting used to a different type of consciousness. Yeah, I would Thanks. say so. Yes, and one more thing I would add to that is that what's crucial to establish this connection with yourself to such an extent where it supersedes, it, it's more important than anything else, is to really desire that, to really see the relevance of that. The human nature is wired in such a way that it will always choose the path that it perceives to be the most beneficial, always. So if you're walking down a path that you instinctually know is not good for you, you must have a few beliefs, or even just one belief, that perceives a lot of value in walking the path that you know is not actually good for you. For example, in the dancing scenario, it might be that um, maybe you instinctively feel like dancing. The music is hitting you in a certain way and you feel the vibration and you want to move. You just want to move. Don't even call it dancing. You just want to move because there is this flow to that experience. You want to merge with the tones in the room. So you feel like moving. That is the resonance, right? In that moment, that's the natural, spontaneous, childlike sense of, I want to move. That's what's true. That's what's authentic. What comes in then is the idea of other people looking at you. And the belief is that I will get love if I don't do anything stupid. That's what most people think. If I don't act stupid, I'll be loved and accepted. I won't stand out. If I don't stand out, at least I can't be an epic fail. 
right? Especially with dancing, because everyone is stupid when they're dancing, unless they've had sufficient training, but even then it's subjective. So every, just assume that everyone looks stupid when they're dancing, when they're moving. It's just a natural, weird thing. Everyone is different. There's not one way to move, right? Just in this example. And <clears throat> so the, the belief that leads you onto a path that's actually not of your resonance, but of your resistance to your true self, is something perceives benefit in not doing what you enjoy doing in that moment. The thought in this case probably being along the lines of, if I just don't move, even though I naturally want to move, but if I don't move, then at least they will not hate me. Maybe they may not love me because I don't stand out in an awesome way either, but they won't at least reject me or hate me or think I'm silly or stupid, which would equate to not being loved, not being accepted. So even though you know it's in your highest resonance to start moving in that scenario, you don't move because there is a belief in your mind that suggests there's a benefit to not moving. Hence, you will not move. So what's crucial with anything in life, and especially when it comes to maintaining integrity to your own connection all the way through and not caring what other people think, whether it's in integrity with relationships, communication, or dancing, or setting up your business, or whatever it is. Speaking your truth, no matter what, no matter who's around, no matter how it may land on their ears, no matter how they may interpret that, no matter how much they will love or hate project onto you. You need to desire to speak your truth and open, open your energy system in that sense. You need to want to be in alignment with yourself, more so than you wish to be loved by an outside source. And one way to eliminate ideas like that is to think, do you really care whether that silly looking person over there, which doesn't know shit, what they think of me? Really? Is that worth sacrificing your own energetic true alignment connection with? You need to see 100% benefit only in maintaining your own connection and zero benefit in not maintaining your own connection. If you have beliefs that suggest that not maintaining your own connection, your own truth, not being in alignment is somehow in your best interest, do everything, everything you can to transmute that idea and to show it that it's not true. Remember that it's truer to be true and that it's more rewarding to be true. As soon as your mind agrees with your true perspective, which is it's more beneficial to be in alignment and to speak my truth than it is to not be in alignment and speak my truth, no matter what the rewards may be, when I choose to not be myself, the end result will always be cancer. Do you want to gain cancer by being loved by someone that's absolutely stupid, ridiculous, and doesn't know what they're talking about, and forgets about you two seconds later? Is that worth cancer and misalignment and not creating the life of your dreams? I don't think so. It's nonsensical. So be in alignment with yourself. Breathe in your soul, breathe out your soul. Hmm. Think your soul, speak your soul. Feel your soul, act out your soul. That's all you need to know. This is all about you. They are reflections of yourself anyway, generated out of your own higher self energy. They don't actually exist in the way that you think they do. They are mirrors of you. So don't fear yourself, you're just talking to yourself. Does that make sense? You gotta align your vision as to what benefits you and what not. So much of the spiritual journey and clarity has to do with, and so much of spirituality would be simply eliminated and made redundant immediately if people simply knew what truly benefited them. If they cared enough about their lives to get their perspectives in alignment, to simply recognize very acutely, very clearly, like a Hitler on yourself, loving Hitler, very precise, be on top of it. Hey, is there benefit in that or is there not? But people don't care, you see? Just like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't know what's good for me or not. I don't care. I don't care what I want. It's all good anyway. It's all consciousness, you know. So we get sloppy. We get totally sloppy. We get totally lazy. And then we get totally cancerous. You don't want that. It's not worth it, is it? We wither and die, quite literally. We want to be alive. We want to be infinitely ageless. And in order to be tapped into that source, 
you need to align your vision as to what serves you and what's not, what does not serve you. So, so much of this is about mental clarity. It's about logic. It's sensical to understand that it makes sense to follow your heart and not the belief that other people can love you or hate you. It does not make sense from a higher mind's point of view. So, so much of the spirituality gets eliminated and transcended and the need for it disappears. In other words, you achieve everything that spirituality teaches you in an instant as soon as you understand and align the perspectives you have as to does this serve me? Does that serve me? I can gain a little bit of love over there. I can avoid a little bit of rejection over here. If you simply get really, really real and clear and care about yourself for a moment and just align that and have that no-nonsense policy, have that no-nonsense policy field up like a lightsaber, like this whole field around you, no nonsense allowed, then you will naturally become more precise with yourself and notice when something is in or out of alignment, when something serves you or not. Does that make sense? Will you do this to an extent? Yes, sir. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay. I feel like I should let somebody else ask okay. questions. Well, that's very kind of you. Thank you. Can you put it in the corner? Yeah, thank you. Earlier you said that these evolved relationships are very rare. Mm. <laughs> I mean, somewhat. Not as rare, perhaps, in this group, but rare on, the, on one global collective scale. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. Okay. So uh, my last two relationships have been amazing in the mm. sense of learning, in the sense of finding out more about me, what I like, what I don't like, what I feel um, that I'm lacking or, or think that I have a need of. And so that's been awesome. Beautiful. But uh, my question is, is at what point do we get evolved enough to where these relationships become more, I should, more or easier or common? Yeah. Because I don't think we're there yet. And I think we really have to come to a place where we really know ourselves like things you were talking about today yeah. to, to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And until we do that, we're just going through the motions of pretending to be in a relationship, pretending that yeah. we're okay, pretending that... You know, we don't have a lack and, and everything is good. Right. <laughs> and, and not that that's bad and we don't learn anything from them. Sure. But it's still just the facade of a great relationship. Right, right, right. Yeah. So is it possible, first of all, and, and to what extent is that possible? Totally. And once we get to that point where we're so evolved, will we even need to be in a relationship? Will no, but it will still, no, not in that sense, but it will still continue to be a relationship because it's relevant, because it's beautiful, because it's the way the universe works and continues to learn. But we'll definitely pass the threshold. So when I said, I've just remembered what you referenced, when I said it was rare, I was talking specifically about the total reciprocated connection of absolute infinite worth recognizing absolute infinite worth. Now that is quite rare. I'm not saying that amazing relationships are very rare because they happen all the time and we learn and we churn and we expand. That is much more common, right? But when it comes to what you're talking about now, what you're hinting at is a state of absolute clarity as to our own infinite worth to the point where we can recognize when we look in someone else's eyes, all we see is the one. And, when, and the magical thing is when that's reciprocated, and I know it sounds silly because this is all your own creation and you can create that experience, but when it's reciprocated, it does something magical that I can only hint at. And that is very rare. Mm -hmm. and, but that's fine, that's okay. So what is required for that? What is the threshold for that? How can we measure that? It's by our own sense of infinite worth. So as we move through the quote-unquote energy centers, which is just a symbol, but it's relative relatively relevant and we work on you know sort of transcending our purely based sense of self-protection and then we start opening up to unconditional love and we start to see that other people are loving beings and they're creatures with their own free will we start to respect that more and live and let live and then <clears throat> we start to express ourselves fully which is the dancing thing i talked about for example where which is just an example but this applies to anything in life where we no longer reference ourselves through other people's eyes 
but we become free expressions of who we truly are. And this is where most people actually are a little tripped up, a little stuck in that sense. It's not so much that they can't access love. In especially, I'm talking to you guys and my viewers and the community, many people have that, like that open heart, they can access that. <clears throat> but to the extent where they can fully express themselves, where they can fully crystallize who they are as an individuation of consciousness, with the absolute absence of referencing other people's opinions, that is quite rare. That's where we're, in a sense, working on most of us, many of us in these spiritual communities, such as my own, in a sense. So, but when that becomes more fully open, more fully open, then what opens up is the sense of infinite worth. You see, because that comes usually through being able to express yourself fully. That's how you tap into the energy field that is you as the infinite creature, as the infinite creator. And then this starts to recognize itself, become aware of itself at this vibratory level. I'm just using the chakras as a symbol right now. This third eye idea of recognizing infinite worth, recognizing that you are an infinite creature. And then when that opens up, it opens up to everything else, the universal connection. But it allows you to recognize that same oneness in other, pe in other people, in other beings. And that's when, if that's reciprocated, if both are at that stage of clarity, that is what I meant with it's quite rare. When do we reach that point? Well, we can very, very clearly measure that in ourselves by simply right now taking a deep breath, closing your eyes. and asking yourself, how worthy and amazing do I feel I am? And at the level where that stops, you start to be a little excited, a little excited, and then it stops. That's the level you're working at. And you just keep expanding that boundary. Keep expanding how worthy you feel, how ecstatic you feel, how true you feel, how much you feel like you are a creature of infinite worth. And you keep expanding that energy. It becomes more and more blissful, more and more bright, brighter light. Brighter, brighter, more and more expansive. And then at some point you feel a little, a little contraction. A little belief comes up. Well, this is too much bliss for me to be worthy of. This is too much light for me to handle. And that's exactly what it is. It's too much light for you to handle. That's exactly what it is, because that's what you're saying to the universe, because that's what you're believing about yourself. So right there you reach another plateau, another threshold, another layer of beliefs, and usually you will find that it has something to do with being afraid of fully expressing yourself, fully being yourself, fearing the consequences of other people and all that stuff. So open up that throat chakra in that sense. Bring that light even higher, even brighter, and realize that you are entitled to express yourself as fully as you want to by the very nature, by the very fact that you exist. Existence wants your voice heard, expressed, your desires manifest. Otherwise, it wouldn't give you desires. Otherwise, it wouldn't have created you in, to begin with. You are infinite worth. Your existence is meant to exist. Otherwise, you would not exist because consciousness, God, does not make mistakes. It does not create redundancy. You are not redundant. You are infinite worth. You are infinite expression. And you are meant to be yourself with zero reference to what other people think of you. So brighten up that light. Feel that infinite love, that infinite self-worth. Increase and increase and let the bliss pour down into your body, into your being. And know that you are infinite worth and let nothing else matter anymore. No one else matters. No one else matters but you. Give yourself that gift for a moment. I'm not saying you become a dick. I'm just saying <laughs> that you become absolutely clear on who you are and that you're worthy for your own free will to be free. If you don't let your free will be free, then you're not going to let other people's free will be free, and you're simply not ready for relationship, not this type of relationship. So you got to let your free will be free so that you can have the empowerment and the infinite worth found inside of you, an expression, infinite expression found inside of you, free expression, so that when you are in that empowered state of being, when you are that God in a body, with a body, I should say, then, then you can fully attract that type of relating, that type of relationship, naturally, effortlessly. Then you are ready for that light. Then you won't squeeze it when it's given to you. Then you will let it come and go so that the next even more beautiful, abundant thing can come and go as well. So when are you ready? You will know that you're ready. A, when it happens, obviously, but even before it happens, you can know that you're ready. We're no longer needing the projections external to you, outside of yourself. When you can feel infinite love and worth and happiness just by being you, just by being crazy, just by being 
absolutely you. Just being so satisfied with being you, just feeling so amazing about yourself, feeling that you are a creature of infinite light, of infinite worth. When you feel that, you start to operate as an infinite being, as an eternal vibrational consciousness. And then sky's the limit or the beginning. And then relationships start to open up as well. All kinds of relationships, all kinds of dynamics, all kinds of purposes behind it that you then start to be able to become a part of, in a sense, fulfill a role in. And it's beautiful, and you're going to be of service in many ways. You're going to benefit a lot of yourself out there precisely because you increase your light so much that you don't need anything from anyone, that you can start to actually give and act according to what is most required or necessary or asked for. You'll be in love with yourself, with your own source. You'll be so excited that you exist, that that's really all you need. And not in a pitiful, sort of like cheesy way. Like, no, I am all I need. I don't need anyone else. But in a true way, like you're actually ecstatic about being alive. You're actually excited that you are who you are. And you wouldn't change that for the world. You wouldn't exchange that for anything, for anyone. Your connection to Source is the only life-giving essence in your life. You know that you can't actually get energy from anyone else. You can only get it from the degree of alignment you have with yourself, the degree of free will that you allow yourself to have in every moment. That's where you get the light from. That's where you get the energy from, the sustenance. That's what sustains you. That's what empowers you. That's what creates your reality. So remember that you are a being of infinite light. That is when you will be ready. That is when we'll see it more and more and more in our society, more and more reflected in us. Don't be harsh on yourself when human stuff comes up. Simply note that they are lack beliefs and move through it as graciously as you can. Sometimes that simply looks messy. That's okay. That's quite all right. That's quite all right. It's quite understandable. Feelings can sometimes be hard to interpret because we've learned to interpret them in hard ways. When it's very simple in essence. So allow yourself to go through those periods of, in a sense, purging those old beliefs, transforming them, showing them that you now know that you are of a higher vibratory state of alignment, of infinite worth. And then they leave you alone. They disappear. They become merged back into your being. There's so much room in yourself that you can include them even. But they'll just be outshone by the light that you are, by the confidence that you are. And then you keep moving on. Moving on, moving on, expanding, expanding, creating more and more delicious realities for yourself to the point where if you think back two weeks ago, it seems depressing to you. You don't want to live a single day in your life already lived because you move on every single minute and you're so much happier with what you have now, with what you've created now, with the reflection that you see now. And then the question of moving on or not moving on starts to become more irrelevant. The idea of growing apart no longer seems like a negative thing. It seems like the most sensical thing in the world. Two beings are never meant to be together forever, unless they really are, but it's rare. It's pretended by way too many of us that that's the way creation works. It's really not in most cases. If you doubt, in general, I would say, consider moving on. Because it's contradicting what you believe, which can somehow inhibit or cloud your vision of what's true, sometimes. Do as resonates, do what resonates. But aim for freedom, aim for love. Let your free will be free and let their free will be free. That's the way to love each other, to honor the universe. Every connection is sacred. Every connection is sacred. Most of all, yours with your own. If you make that one really, really strong, then you can let yourself have that true connection with yourself and other people. And you can let those other people more and more have those connections with themselves and with other people. Recognize that ultimately you would not want to detract from that person relating to someone else because you're detracting from more of yourself. 
It doesn't mean anything if someone else goes with someone else. So hard, isn't it, to believe that? But it's not. Not when you reach higher levels of light and brightness. When you're in your really clear moments, you feel so on top of the world that anything can be stolen from you and you wouldn't even flinch or blink an eye. You'd be absolutely ecstatic at everything being taken away from you because it's all the same abundance. And you are a creature of infinite possibility. So why be afraid when point zero 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 Honestly, I'm not just seeing the whole number and I can't speak it in the next eight hundred billion years. If I would continue to say zero zero zero, it would still not be there. One, let's just skip eight hundred billion years. Percent of all of creation is taken away from you. You would not care. It still exists. You just move on to another portion of it. You own all of creation. You own infinite possibility. So don't latch on to what you see because what you see is a reflection of who you were. Of course it needs to move so that something new can be created and your new vibratory state can be reflected in physical reality. If you hold on to it too tightly, A, it will wither and die, you will wither and die, and your new reality won't come to fruition. And when the reality you do have thus finally gets stolen away from you, you don't know what to do with yourself. So allow yourself to recreate yourself on all levels of your being, especially the manifest level, over and over and over and over and over again. Thank you. Oh yeah, thank you so much. That was actually the next question I was going to ask is what's the barometer and you answered that. So awesome. Well, thanks. Thank you so much. Perfect. I got a few announcements, I think. Let's see. So we have a free March retreat coming up. Um, my birthday is March 13th, so the weekend of Saturday, Sunday, 14th and 15th of March, I'm giving a free weekend retreat at the Marriott Hotel here in Boulder. Uh, there is only room for 200 people, 100 people signed up in the last two days, so if you want to act on it as a local community, I would suggest that. Do we have something here? Can they leave their name here? Or they, wait, maybe it says it here, let's see. Although the retreat is free, pre-registration is required, we have a limited number of seats, so before registering, please make sure you are 100% committed to attending. Registration is halfway full, so please sign up soon for your seat to be guaranteed. Um, we will go onto a wait list once we reach our capacity of 200 people. You can register by visiting www.bentinomasaro.com slash boulder. So if you don't know how to write my name, that's B-E-N-T-I-N-H-O-M-A-S-S. -S aro.com slash boulder. Um, then we have a Sedona retreat coming up, which is a longer, more in-depth retreat. It's called, oh wait, the March retreat is called Consciously Create Your Reality, Discover the Power That Moves Mountains. Epic. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could attend. Sedona retreat is called Master Your Bliss, Master Your Future. The idea behind that is that many people think that um, many people think that they need to think about their future in order to actually manage their future and control and protect and all that stuff. But the best way to master your future is to actually master your bliss presently, to learn how to use your frequency wisely and to already be in the state of being what you want to be and who you want to be and what you want to have, being already in that bliss. And then very naturally your future will rearrange itself. So this is a six-day retreat, I think, from April 24th through 29th at the Sedona Creative Life Center. Academy members 
uh, receive a 70% discount if they joined the Academy prior to January 24th. So I have this, this thing with the Academy where those that are committed to really, really digesting this teaching, they join my Academy, period. So if they do that, then uh, if they've done that for three months, I feel that they've committed enough of their time and of their study to really get those basics so that as a group and in the retreats, we can actually take off and make things really interesting. So we don't have to, you know, 50% of the people don't have to wait for the rest of the 50% to ask the same questions they already know, but they all pay to be at the retreat to have an awesome experience. So go join my academy because it's epic, it's awesome, it's life transforming. It is $45 a month, it's a two week free trial. Um, and all retreats in the future will be 70 to 100% discount once you've been in there for, 30, for three months. So, so if you want to register for the Sedona retreat, go to mentimasr.com slash events slash Sedona. But if you just go to events, you'll see it. Um, and if you're not already signed up for our local email list, in case of cancellations or changing our normal Monday night routine, we recommend that you sign up, which should be on the table, is that correct? So as you leave the room, you can sign up there and we'll add you to the local email newsletter. And okay, to those here and also the live streamers, we are building a team of volunteers to create and distribute content. We would like help with things like graphic design, editing, transcribing, YouTube, etc. If you have a passion and an interest in volunteering for the Bentinho Masara organization, please fill out the form on the table by the door. And if you're tuning into the live stream and would like to volunteer, send an email to alasarnoff at gmail.com. That's A-Y-L-A-S-A-R-N-O-F-F at gmail.com. With your name, location, contact info, and your area of interest. And one more thing for those local here, we would like to gauge your interest in having a community dinner once a month, uh, like at the end of the month, the last meeting of the month, after the meeting here at the Integral Center. This can be ordering pizza from Ideal Market or a potluck or something else. But we're wanting to gauge interest in how many people would want to participate in this every last Monday of every month. Any hands that resonates? Okay, seems like significant enough to implement that. So every last Monday of the month, we'll be having just social time here, some music, some pizza, or whatever. Thank you all, and thanks, Ayla. That's awesome. <laughs>